<laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Bluestein, the chairman of Garfunkel Wild, and therefore, on behalf of Garfunkel Wild, I want to thank you for attending the 11th annual ASC and Healthcare Management Symposium. It's hard to believe that it's been 11 years since we started this educational endeavor and we are very proud to remain virtual and free. While we do miss out on the social interactions that we had uh, before COVID, uh, know that over 320 people have registered and it's still going up as I speak, um, and no one had to travel. So those are big benefits. Um, we have three live sessions, uh, which are in addition to a pre-recorded sessions, uh, to prove to you that I am talking to you in real time, uh, let me take a moment to say thank you to Anthony Volpe for hitting a grand slam last night to save the New York Yankees from being eliminated. Um, Anthony was going to be our keynote speaker, but unfortunately he needs to get ready for tonight's game. So we'll, we'll get him next year. Our second live session will happen right after I finish. And our featured speaker is Bill Prentice, CEO of the Ambulatory Surgery Center Association. And the moderator is my partner and friend, Greg Bloom. Finally, our last session, and put a little sticky on your computer now, starts at 3.30 and will be live and have all of our speakers together. So if you're listening to a session today and you wanna ask a question to one of our speakers, you can send the question, again, take a pen, to mkaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N, at garfunkelwild.com. Or, here's a shameless plug, you can get on our website, uh, garfunkelwild.com, uh, pick any of our offices, our main numbers. We have six offices, and you can call the receptionist and give them your, um, your information your question and then Mandy will get it to us. Um, okay, and during the live session, there is a Q&A box, but it would be better if we get the questions before because we're not gonna get the Q&A till after. Last question, uh, last point. Um, if you don't have your agenda handy, you can again go to our website, garfunkawild.com, scroll down to trending topics. You just move the cursor down and then click on the 11th Annual ASC Healthcare Management Symposium. You'll see the agenda, um, and I think it'll help you navigate today. Um, if you're not sure if you have the latest agenda, um, see if at 12.30 on your agenda there's a, se a session on valuation. This was a late addition. So in total, there are nine sessions before the live Q&A at 3.30. If for some reason you have to get off, I don't know what else you could do, eat or whatever, you can get back on using the exact same um, Q&A, uh, exact same link. So you can join to the Q&A, you can join to any sessions. So it will, it will be there. The agenda, if you are looking at it, is jam-packed with things. We have first session we're going to have is regulatory, we have payer audit session, clinical adverse outcomes, transactions, accreditation readiness, revenue cycle process, AI implementation, valuation perspective, and probably most fittingly, a session on provider mental health issues. Um, and the day is jam-packed. But today could not have happened without the many people who helped with the marketing and IT, including Miguel uh, and his team um, uh, for IT support, and my partners, Kim Kempton, Greg Bloom, and Nicole Gade, who spent a lot of time um, getting this together uh, and creating the event. And of course, Mandy Kaplan, who's been keeping everything organized and on track with a lot of coordination efforts. But our biggest thank you has to go out to our speakers both those at GW and our industry experts who took the time to bring us incredible information and collaborated with other speakers, which is always difficult. And because of virtual, some people have to even record more than once. Uh, none of our speakers get paid. 
to present today. They did this simply to help advance the seminar's single goal of education. Of course, if you like a speaker and you want to use their services or you want to join your association, uh, please contact them directly and that would be great because really without our speakers today does not happen. And finally, thank you all for attending because without an audience, our seminar would be not practical. Uh, and we know that everyone's super busy and it's hard to take the time, you know, to advance your knowledge and gain some new perspectives. Um, but we think it's really important for everyone's development. Um, and today's symposium will definitely uh, give you education and perspectives. So um, you will be getting, and a lot of people ask this, so I'll say it also at the end, um, all the registrants will get all the presentation materials and you'll get a recording of all the sessions and we'll get to this to you by Monday or Tuesday of next week. So with that out of the way, I want to turn the Zoom podium over to my partner, Greg Bloom, to lead us through our first session titled State of the Union. Greg, take it away. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and good morning. Uh, as Andrew said, my name is Greg Bloom. I'm a partner director at Garfunkel Wild and the co-chair of Garfunkel Wild's corporate department. And I also want to thank you all for joining us today at the 11th annual ASC and Healthcare uh, Symposium. I'm going to keep my introduction very brief today. As I think all of you know, our speaker, Bill Prentice, who has been with us for each of the 11 years of the symposium. Uh, Bill, I want to, I believe that you are the only speaker other than a few of us at Garfunkel Wild who has been with us for 11 years. So uh, first of all, I want to thank you for that. I think congratulations, I'm not sure. Uh, and very much thank you for sharing so much knowledge with us over the 11 years. It's been great having you. Um, Bill Prentice is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ambulatory Surgery Center Association and the Ambulatory Surgery Center Association Foundation. ASCAR is a national organization that represents over 6,000 ambulatory surgery centers in the United States and provides advocacy, education, benchmarking, and staff training for its members. Um, during today's session, I'm going to be asking Bill a series of questions and some hot topics uh, in the ASC area. We hope you find this helpful, and if you have any questions along the way, um, Andrew gave you some information. You could email mkaplan at Garfunkel Wild or call any of our offices. Um, and with that, I don't want to cut Bill's time. I want to get right into information from Bill. Um, so Bill, look, the first question you usually talk about um, is the proposed ASC Medicare payment rule, and that was um, just released in July. Can you give us the, the highlights and lowlights uh, in terms of payments, procedures, and quality reporting requirements from that? Sure. Well, first, uh, thank you, Greg, and thank you to Andrew for you know, giving me an, another opportunity to talk. Um, I'll, I'll expect you know some kind of prize or trophy for being you know <laughs> uh, such a constant present at your symposiums. Um, but yeah, the uh, the Medicare payment rule is obviously you know one of the sentinel events that happens in the AAC community every year. It's you know the one opportunity each year where CMS uh, you know kind of sets you know the inflationary uh, you know payment increases for surgery centers. Uh, for the coming year. So this everything I'm talking about uh, with this proposed rule will take effect in January um, for 2025. Um, and it also is the opportunity, the, the primary opportunity for CMS to address any kind of regulatory changes they want to make to the, the Medicare program um, with regard to this rule um, as it uh, you know, relates to surgery centers and hospital outpatient departments primarily. Um, we're probably a day, uh, maybe two days away from that final rule being released. So everything I'm talking about uh, with regard to the rule is the proposal. Um, the proof of the pudding will be in what's released, you know, maybe sometime tomorrow or Friday, statutorily supposed to come out by November 1. Um, so in terms of highlights, lowlights, uh, first is that the proposal has a 2.6% inflationary update and that is the same update as the hospital outpatient departments because we are for the, you know, maybe the last time being updated using that same hospital market basket inflation factor that has historically been used for the hospitals. We've been on a, on a pilot where we have been updated using that same inflation factor, 
those who've been around for a long time may remember that before that we were updated using a different inflation factor, the consumer price index for all urban consumers. And the issue with that was that, you know, overall consumer inflation generally is outpaced by medical inflation. Um, so back in those days, the hospitals were getting a larger inflationary update uh, than we were. So leaving aside the fact we're already, you know, paying, you know, being paid roughly 50 cents on the dollar, we were falling further and further behind because of using these two different inflation factors. So one of our big pieces of advocacy in our comments to CMS this year, and will continue forward into 2025, is to try and get us placed on that hospital market basket going forward. Um, so last thing I'll say about the inflation factors, we did see that with the inpatient hospitals, um, their uh, proposed inflationary increase actually went up a little bit in the intervening time before that rule was finalized. So there's some small hope that that 2.6% may be a little bit larger. Um, and if it goes up for the hospitals, it'll go up for you as well. Exactly. Because we right. this is the last year we're still being updated on that same inflation factor. Now, I, I always have to caution people that 2.6% varies by procedure and varies by region. So, you know, you're obviously going to have to look at your, your local, you know, wage, you know, um, or excuse me, uh, uh, indices to, to make sure you're, you're, you're getting paid what you're supposed to. Um, the other thing that happens in this rule, and you may recall last year, we were, we were very pleasantly surprised to get, you know, total shoulder and total ankle um, you know, added to our procedure list, meaning that we can get reimbursed by Medicare for doing those. Um, that was through a lot of advocacy that we did because uh, in the intervening time between when that rule, last year's rule was proposed and finalized because those procedures were not in that proposed rule. This was the first year where CMS was supposed to use a more transparent process for us to submit um, procedures that we would like to see added. Um, we were very disappointed in that we did use that new process to, you know, get some, uh, ask for additional spine procedures, um, as well as a number of cardiology codes. Um, and there was no mention of them in the proposed rule. Uh, so we were very disappointed to not even get any feedback on the fact there was no feedback on any procedures that had been requested by whether us or any other, you know, interested party. So we'll be very disappointed if in this final rule that comes out, there is not even a mention of these procedures, you know, to give us some kind of understanding as to why they weren't being added to our list. That, that is disappointing, but I, I am sure you will continue to advocate on behalf of everyone out there. Yeah, and the thing we, we really work with is, is the specialty society. So for example, the Heart Rhythm Society, which obviously uh, you know, are the, the physicians that do ablations and EP procedures, um, they are strongly advocating for more of these procedures to be moved to the surgery center um, space. And we've been working pretty closely with them this year and, and actually have a plan to do so going forward in an effort to try and convince the medical directors at CMS that these procedures can be safely performed on, on appropriate patients. Right. Uh, is, there, what, is there any likelihood that any of those procedures will get into the final rule, even though they haven't mentioned it? Oh. Hope springs eternal. I mean, as I said, you know, we were pleasantly surprised that shoulder and ankle ended up, uh, you know, in the final rule last year right. without having been in the proposed rule. So, you know, I, I my my team is pessimistic about it, um, but uh, you know, I, 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 I'll keep hope alive until we see the final rule. All right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed as well. Um, moving on, uh, Congress has devoted a lot of time and attention to healthcare transparency. Um, legislation this past year. What's driving that and, and how would it concern uh, surgery centers? Uh, I, I mean, there's, I think, a number of things driving. One, I think that historically healthcare has not been uh, a very transparent place, you know, not easy for consumers to discern what they're being paid or what the quality of the care they're, they're going to receive from the facility they're going to, whether the hospital, physician office, wherever. Um, so I, I think this has been long in coming uh, to try and infuse more, uh, you know, transparency and shine a light on, on some of these things. And it's something, quite honestly, that we in the AASC community embrace because we know that we are the lower cost provider um, in our space and we know that we provide very good care to our patients. So we're not opposed to transparency. 
Um, I think the concerns we've had with you know federal efforts have been just the burdens that they're placing on providers uh, as the means for providing that transparency. So for example, the No Surprises Act, which we've talked about in past years, still not fully implemented, still waiting for regulations to come down from um, HHS. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and feel it's still not fully baked, yet that hasn't stopped Congress from trying to pass additional legislation on top of it to put new regulatory burdens on healthcare providers, um, such as having to post pricing um, on your website. And this, there's legislation that's passed the House to require that, uh, has not passed or seen any action in the Senate yet. There are Senate sponsors for it. Um, we were very concerned that when Congress, you know, comes back after the November election, that this is one of the bills they might take up. Uh, recently, we're hearing that that may not be the case, um, which would be a good thing, because again, this is another burden being placed on healthcare providers with, you know, heavy penalties for non-compliance. Right. At the same time that we haven't even fully implemented the No Surprises Act. So, so it's, a, it's a really good point. We hear it all the time from from our clients that, um, you know, they're not even sure how to com how to comply with with these laws that are coming out, and and, and more are coming, and more are coming. So, the yeah, burden, and, the and this is really a, a topic where members of Congress, it's they to them, it's a feel good thing that they you know makes them look good, like they're helping patients. Um, I, I will tell you that the, the, you know, the legislation is moving forward, you know, first of all, would have a very nominal impact on helping patients because we also know also know the way the patients behave and the way that they find their ways to surgery centers and to, you know, uh, and it doesn't involve basically shopping. Right. Um, They're driven I, by their physicians. Generally. Exactly. And, 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 and look, I would love if there, if consumer, you know, health cares were better consumers, because I think that would bring more patients to our door that just historically has not been the way patients have behaved. Right. Absolutely. So there's also been a lot of legislation, legislative in, interest in, uh, particularly at the state level in eliminating facility fees. Uh, why is that happening? And how, how is that going to impact our ASCs? Yeah, this this is a, a place where, I, again, I think it gets to the fact that our lawmakers are not experts. They're not subject matter experts. And when they see a problem and they try and address it, um, they sometimes go overboard. Um, and, and so the I think the reasoning that this issue of facility fees has risen up is because of the, you know, in recent times, purchases by hospitals and health systems of physician practices and making them part of the hospital. So you as a patient, Greg, you know, you go to see your, your GP, you go into the same office that you did last year for your physical, all of a sudden now though, this is part of the health system. And so you're technically, even though you're walking to the same door to the same office, where last year it was your physician's practice, it's now part of a hospital. And as a result of that, you're gonna get an additional bill or charge from the hospital um, because they'll charge a facility fee for that. Nothing has changed in the care you're receiving other than the fact of who now owns that practice. Right. And so I think that has sparked a lot of outrage uh, amongst you know healthcare consumers and and and, and regulators and and you know lawmakers. So they're to try and address it, they have, I think, ham-handedly in some cases, you know, Texas being the prime example, introduced legislation to eliminate facility fees in healthcare. Wow. And of course. That's preposterous because obviously the facility fee Cost. pays for everything that happens right. inside the surgery center, except for you know the the you know the, the physicians you know reimbursement. So you know we've obviously had to you know jump up and and try and educate lawmakers that the, you know to the extent that this is a problem, they need to use a scalpel you know and, and not a broadsword. Uh, and to date, we've been very successful in in kind of educating lawmakers and stopping any of these overly broad bills from being passed at the state level. Um, so that's the source of it. That's the genesis of it. And the underlying, you know, um, really message here is, as in so many things that we work on, um, lawmakers don't understand us and it's really incumbent upon us. And, and by us, I don't just mean the association. I mean, you know, the entire ASC community uh, to be constantly meeting with their lawmakers, both at the federal and state level, to make sure they understand who we are and what we do. That, that is a fantastic point because, as, as you say, as a as a user, I'm going to see the same doctor. 
I feel like it should be the same bill, but the procedures are being done, the costs to do it in a hospital or surgery center are so much more substantial without the facility fee. Yeah. You, you'll drive those out of business. So Yeah, and I, I will leave it to somebody from the hospital or health system side to try and justify why they need to charge a facility fee for that. Um, but but I can just say that obviously, you know, educating consumers about, you know, what a facility fee pays for um, in our space is critically important. Right. Um, so we're seeing a lot more private equity investment in healthcare, um, and it's receiving a lot of attention. Um, do you expect Congress to take any any action on that? Uh, it, not this Congress. And again, we're obviously at the at the very tail end of of the this session. We'll have a new Congress, you know, starting you know in January. Of course, open question as to what the complexion of that Congress will be in terms of who will control. Right now, we have you know uh, a small Republican majority in the House and a very very slim uh, majority in the Senate uh, for the Democrats. Um, I think there's a lot of people who think that I actually could flip and that we could go the other way. Um, you know, next Congress. We'll know in a week. <laughs> we well, we hope we hope we'll know. <laughs> a week or so. Uh, we'll know in a week but, or so. But 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 this is an, an issue of this issue of private equity and the influence of capital on on healthcare has received a lot of attention, and it has been bipartisan. And it's one where actually you know one of the things that's been kind of a very interesting dynamic that we've seen over the last couple of Congresses and, and in our political system is that you know where historically Republicans were you know friends of Wall Street, you know friends of you know of, of corporate America. There is now, uh, particularly on the far right, a, a lot of distrust of Wall Street and corporate America. There's a lot of distrust in authority um, that mirrors what we've always seen on the far left. And so you're seeing this very kind of odd dynamic where the far left and the far right are almost coming around to meet each other, you know, on some issues right. and things like private equity are, are, you know, a perfect target for that. So again, one of the things that you know we need to do is to educate our lawmakers about the fact that, you know, surgery centers need access to capital in order to grow and expand uh, to provide the wealth of services that we provide. For example, if a facility wanted to start doing cardiology, there's a tremendous expense involved with that in terms of retrofitting and expanding the surgery center. And obviously, when we do that, it's in the hopes of creating an opportunity to, for, for patients to get the same great health care they've always gotten, but at a lower, more efficient price because it's being done in the surgery center and outpatient. Um, but there are plenty of examples out there where private equity has had an untoward influence on things in health care. You see it in nursing homes. You hear it about in some hospitals. Um, I think the important thing is to differentiate that we haven't seen that in our space and that we remain you know, wary of that. Um, and to the extent that we need our lawmakers to get involved in somehow you know, playing a role, they should put the guardrails on the private equity community, not on healthcare providers that are already overburdened with regulation. Make, makes sense. So, so talking about uh, funding a capital, um, a lot of times capital for surgery centers comes from hospital equity participation. Um, have you seen any changes over the last few years in hospital participation or? Uh, I mean, uh, look, not, we, I think we've always seen, you know, uh, you know, a role for hospitals to be partners with surgery centers in, in markets. Um, that has been a very common characteristic of the ASC model. Um, I think there's been a recognition, you know, by the hospitals and health systems that, ASCs are, are, are a really important tool to have um, in their in their toolbox of providing care in their community. So, um, you know, whether it's having like large companies like HCA, which obviously has, you know, a very strong and well-regarded line of surgery centers that's now branded as Surgery Ventures. We obviously have, you know, Tenet Healthcare, which acquired USPI um, and, and is now the largest, you know, management company by, you know, number of facilities in the country. But I think there's always been kind of a marriage between, you know, hospitals and surgery centers. Not to say that there's still not a lot of conflict in, in, in markets where, um, where the hospital and uh, outpatient department and the surgery center are, you know, deem, you know seem to be in competition for, for patients. Yeah, at the end of the day, um, if you step back and look at our healthcare system, though, we have more patients in need of care than we have sites of service and providers to provide it. Um, and so I think, you know, the, 
there are certainly plenty areas of this country where there is a paucity of both hospitals and surgery centers. So I, I think, you know, we, you know, we're still sorting this out, but I think there's a role clearly in every market for both types of facilities. Um, and obviously there's plenty of opportunities for, you know, financial integration of them as well. Okay. Um, so Bill, earlier this year, um, CMS gave notice that they want uh, to advance a demonstration project to require prior authorization for some uh, Medicare ASC procedures. What can you tell us about that? So this came completely out of the blue um, with, you know, and just was dropped, you know, this spring, uh, with no, you know, other than this, this notice. And it makes no sense, a nonsensical piece of rulemaking in the sense that, you know, it's supposedly a demonstration project. So it's only going to be in, in a, in, you know, this, the, the states with the highest penetration of surgery centers in terms of number. Um, they mentioned 40 procedures that for which they're going to require this, this, you know, prior off, uh, and right. still do question whether it's the facility or the physician's office that's going to have to do it. Most of those procedures, we do almost no volume in the surgery center. So it's, the, I, I don't know why they picked the procedures and the two procedures for which we do do some volume, um, they're looking at volume numbers uh, during the pandemic which obviously was an extraordinarily odd time for everyone. So, so, so what, are uh, those, what are those two procedures that- uh, uh, I, you, you, you can find them on our website, I believe. I yeah, I, 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 I cannot think of them off the top okay. of my head. I apologize for that. We'll look up. Um, but uh, so, so we obviously pushed back hard that this was nonsensical. It was just, you know, to the extent that anyone has to do it, any of these procedures, just a needless burden. And we just don't know where it came from. And, and the only example, the only thing we've heard back from them, and this is by, by way of some members of Congress kind of challenging the agency about this on our behalf, um, was that, well, they don't, we've done these prior auths in, in other settings, and we're always like, you know, looking out for, you know, fraud or overuse. Um, we already have another procedure. We have RAC audits, you know, where the right. agency can can seek these things out, and, and you know, if they see overuse, um, uh, so this, again, this is nonsensical. Uh, we really put the agency on blast for it. And based, unfortunately, by the response that our, our friends and allies on the Hill received, seems like they're still going to plug away on this. Um, but it's it's really disappointing because it makes no sense. Sounds like another example of what you said before, them just not really understanding the business. Right. They, right. they make these laws and they don't understand. I guess the, the only bright side in what you said is they, they pick procedures that you don't really do that many of so the administrative burden may not be as high but well, it still sounds so far but obviously they can you know add to or change those right. those that procedure list at some point so that's the thing we don't want to see you know again we are being lorded with so much burdens and so much additional things we need to pay for that we're not being reimbursed for this is just another example of something that just you know causes our surgeons our physicians and others to throw up their hands right understood um, so quality of care is always a hot topic for payers and patients. What's ASCA and the ASC uh, quality collaboration working on that we should be aware of? And what's the status of the OAS CAPS um, survey requirement? Well, I'll start off with a positive and then I'm probably going to get increasingly negative on this one, answering this question. All right. On the positive, one of the things the ASC Quality Collaboration um, has been working on, and that's kind of a sister organization of ours um, that is funded by the ASC community and is focused purely on trying to improve quality in surgery centers. Uh, one of the things that they do is they actually create quality measures that we offer up to, to CMS to be added to our program that we think are appropriate and make sense. Um, so the, one of the other things that the quality collaboration did over the last couple of years that we helped them out with was they've created a new patient safety tool, an assessment tool that surgery centers can use. And it's going to be an online tool that you can go use each year to kind of measure yourself against other facilities around the country on all the things that, you know, the quality collaboration um, and ASCA believes are the things you need to do to run a very safe, patient-friendly surgery center. And so, you know, if you want to compare it to like things like the LeapFrog survey or, you know, other surveys that are out there, um, it, it's it's in that vein, but it is, I think, much simpler for a surgery center to use, 
much less complicated, doesn't require a lot of research. We do have a, the quality collaboration does have a validation process to make sure that the data that's being submitted um, is, is accurate. But I think it's going to be a really simple and easy tool for surgery centers to use to benchmark themselves on safety and quality. So that's the good thing that the quality sounds, collaboration has been working. That sounds on. great. And before you get into the bad thing, it, you can you can use it. Sounds like you can use it to kind of benchmark yourself against others. Yeah. Does it, it does it also give suggestions on how to? It does actually. So if you if you are not doing something that you know if you answer no on something where the answer should be yes, it will actually tell you. Well, here's what you need to do. Here are the steps, that's and that's, that's, that's also. ASCO will be offering education around that as well to try and make sure that people know what to do. It's it's uh, free, and uh, and you can find out more about it on that um, QC's website, which is ASCQuality.org. Okay. Now, to turn to the negative. I'll let you get, get in the negative now. Go ahead. What I do, Greg. Um, <laughs> no, you give us a lot of good positive, your advocacy and things you do for the community, but go yeah. ahead. Let's hear um, the negative. The negative is, is that, you know, our CMS quality reporting program that, again, that ASCA, you know, has long supported because we think it was a very useful tool for us to show to policymakers and others the high quality of care that's being provided in the surgery center space. The program recently has been kind of going off the rails in terms of no longer, you know, adding measures that we believe are real measures that apply to an ASC facility and that can be used by both that facility uh, to measure itself again about how it's doing with everyone else in the country, um, as well as for patients to use to kind of identify, you know, good, good good sites of service. And instead, they've been adding measures. So, for example, this year, four measures related to social determinants of health, where now you know the surgery centers can be expected to um, ask every patient that comes in a number of questions, very sensitive questions about. You know, Greg, do you have food insecurity? Do you feel like you have, you know, safe housing? You know, um, do you have, you know, access to transportation? Uh, questions which obviously have no, you know. What does that, have to, what does that have to do with um, getting a colonoscopy? <laughs> well, that's the issue. I mean, clearly uh, these social determinants do have a role in, in, in a person's health. Right. Nobody is arguing with that. The question is, why are we being asked these questions for a, you know, a, a scheduled procedure? Right. Uh, so, you know, important for, a, you know, a community health center to ask, important for, you know, primary yeah. care physician to ask, particularly someone who has answers if the patient does have one of these social determinants, you know, issues with one of these social determinants. We are obviously completely unprepared to be able to assist that patient. So, Greg, if you right. you said yes, I do have food insecurity, I I don't have anything to offer you. I'm just ticking that box on the survey. So, it really is a very going to create really right. awkward conversations between the patients and the surgery center. And mind you, this patient's probably been asked these questions in other places in the chain. Right. Perhaps when we went to their primary care provider who sent them to the surgeon, who sent them to the surgery center. So it's really larding up our program with measures that really don't matter. Right. And you mentioned OSCAPs, which obviously that is going live in January. So, and we still, we, we still know there's probably a couple thousand surgery centers around the country that have not yet signed up with an OSCAPs provider because you, know, you cannot do this, you know, uh, OSCAPs survey internally. You have to use, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a, an outside vendor that's been approved by CMS, of which there are only a handful. Um, I will tell you, though, that for, for our listeners, if any of you still have not done so, um, we have uh, been worked with Press Ganey, who's obviously the largest provider of these surveys and, and all healthcare surveys, um, to negotiate a discount um, for ASCA members. So if you still haven't done so and you're shopping around, be aware that if you're an ASCA member, you can get a discount from Press Ganey. But regardless of which provider, you know, your vendor you go to, you, you got to get on it because it's going to take months to get up and running with this survey. And you need to have 200 completed surveys by the end of 2025. Um, so it's going to take a lot of time and energy. But the overarching problem with the SOSCAP surveys, obviously, it's too long, too expensive, and has, uh, you know, uh, does not have an electronic only format, you have to still have a phone or mail option, which is obviously a more expensive way to try and get these surveys completed. And the fact that just the, the, the scale of the survey that is 34 questions long, 
to try and get a, a patient to respond and answer all those, it's going to be really, really burdensome. So it's going to take a tremendous amount of effort and cost to get those surveys. And they, at the end, to what end? Every surgery center or almost every surgery center was already doing a patient satisfaction survey at much lower cost that was providing many more patients, you know, um, you know answers. And now we're, we're going to create this more burdensome, more expensive, longer survey and get less data. Interesting. Was it, was um, it driven by the legislature or, or were any no, of these, this, these survey, yeah, com survey companies behind it? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to keep point fingers there, but it, it, it's something that came out of the federal government and it was not legislatively required. It's been done by, by regulation. The, the, the end message, though, is, is that what the social determinants of health, this OSCAP survey, the measures that are being added to our program are not being helpful to the surgery centers and are providing, we don't think, are really moving the ball forward in terms of providing evidence of the quality care that we're providing. And the concern that I have is, is obviously the, the stick that the government has is that if you don't submit your Medicare quality data to the government, you get a 2% payment penalty on your Medicare volume. That's, that's tough. Well, but I think, Greg, my concern is, I think we're reaching a tipping point where there are going to be some surgery centers out there. They're going to say, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. I'll, I'll take the 2% penalty or I'll reduce the amount of Medicare volume I do. So, because there is a threshold of 240 cases a year, right. I'm going to go below that. I'm, I'm just not going to do Medicare I don't want this burden. It's too expensive. It's causing too much trouble. That would be bad, and, and I'm not supportive of that, but I think it's going to become increasingly a rational decision uh, for some surgery centers. So I, I, I really, really we've we really complained to CMS that they're they are putting themselves in a position where this program is going to go sideways because of their lack of effort to make the program work right. Yeah, it seems very counterproductive, and then there'll be yeah. fewer sites at which to, to get you care. So. Yeah. So, so a shameless plug for Bill. So that's these two good reasons why you need you need to join ASCA and, and be members. You get the discount for uh, Press Ganey, and Bill's Bill's fighting for you every day. So well, and as long as we're doing uh, shameless plugs, Greg. The other thing is we've made a really big change to ASCA benefits um, for our members in that all of the virtual education that we provide, all our webinars, all our virtual seminars, are going to be free to members starting in January as part of their dues. Um, so we basically have re removed the barrier um, for anyone that's an ASCA member, anyone in a facility, um, to use our education and to receive it free. Great. Great. Um, so, Bill, we keep hearing that insurance companies are requiring more services to be provided in ASCs as they're perceived to be, and quite frankly, are lower cost environments. Where do you see this trend head heading, and do you think there'll be any legislation proposed to push back so patients have choice? Um, I, I think that, you know, I don't, I don't think we're anywhere near close to the point where I'd see, expect legislation to try and weigh in on this. I, I think that historically the payers um, have been too agnostic in terms of where their beneficiaries go to get care. And I think, you know, any steps they take to try and kind of drive care to a lower cost setting, um, I think it's something to try and bend the, the overall cost curve of healthcare in this country. But again, like anything, it has to be done carefully. Uh, I know that the issue of like prior authorization, we just talked about a little while ago, is anathema um, to, to most healthcare providers. And so the extent to which they use that as the means is going to be kind of problematic. And I think you'll get a lot of pushback from hospitals and health systems to that. Um, but I, I think, you know, look, we benefit when the payers step in and I think try and, you know, educate their beneficiaries on how to get to a lower cost site of service because we are almost always that lower cost site of service when it comes to outpatient surgery. Right. Okay. So, so Bill, at last year's seminar, we had a panel discussion about the crisis um, with the shortage of anesthesia providers. Do you have a sense that that remains an issue? And it, um, if so, what steps can be taken to address it on a national level? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, this is a problem 40 years in the making, and it's not something that, you know, 40 days or four months is going to, you know, solve. Um, we are still seeing uh, a shortage of anesthesia providers, and unfortunately, then a, a battle in, in communities about getting access to the anesthesia providers that are there 
you know, between, you know, all the sites of service that require anesthesia. We still hear horror stories of surgery centers having to pay bonuses um, and stipends to, to, in order to get this, the anesthesia they need to keep their doors open and provide care, which is problematic. Just last week, we, we ask get those questions all the time. Yeah. Well, we, just last week we had an ask a board meeting, you know, here in the DC area and we invited in the chief advocacy officer for the American society of anesthesiology um, so that we could have a dialogue with him about what they're doing uh, to try and solve this problem um, and where we could possibly align with them and support their advocacy. But, you know, we clearly need more anesthesiologists, you know, and the problem there is if you're trying to entice residents to become anesthesiologists, I mean, obviously they want to have, be able to have a, a decent income and, and do well. And, and obviously the, the challenge now is the reason that they're seeing some anesthesiologists do very well um, is for the wrong reasons because of a shortage. Um, so I think we need to increase the number of providers. We've also been talking to the nurse anesthesiologist community. Um, you know, the, obviously the ASA you know, has its own scope issues between you know, CRNAs and, and, and the physicians. I mean, those things have to get worked out some way. Um, but, but clearly we need more anesthesiologists uh, and, and we need to, you know, you know, greater access to them. Because again, this is an unfunded mandate. When you have a surgery center having to pay an anesthesia group an extra X number of dollars, it's really hard, if not impossible, to pass that along to anyone. And certainly when you look at your Medicare reimbursements, that's not being reflected. So we've made that case to CMS as well, is that we are being challenged and having to pay so much more for things that we didn't have to pre previously, like you know having to pay extra for to get an anesthesiologist to show up on site, that is not being reflected in our reimbursements. We need help. And, and from our perspective, the, those scenarios that we get asked about all the time need very detailed legal analysis because some some of the methods we've had people say, can we do this? Can we do that? Right. right. Um, just don't pass muster. So. Right. Well, and you're seeing like um, employment, the employment model. Um, right. You know. So yeah. Yeah. They. Um, so. Tough. So uh, we're we're almost almost out of time here, but let me see if I can get one more quick question in. We hear a lot about the war on restrictive covenants. They're they're, they're being outlawed. They're not being outlawed. It attempts to limit enforceability. Um, does the association have any view on the, on this and how do you think it'll impact ASCs? Yeah, uh, I mean, this is another issue in terms from the federal level where I think what happens on next Tuesday will, will play probably a role in whether or not the FTC continues to try and, you know, fight in the courts for the, the, the non-compete, um, you know, regulation that, um, that they tried to implement. Um, I, I think that from our standpoint, the arguments for non-competes make so much more sense in, in other areas other than healthcare, um, that when you're talking about, you know, using them on highly educated physicians and surgeons, um, I think they're well, they're, they're well positioned to obviously negotiate these, you know, um, in a, in a fair way where it is much less, you know, when you see, you hear about these non-competes, you know, at, in, in, you know, grocery stores and other places where there clearly is an imbalance in power. So I think, again, this is another example where I think the federal government saw a problem, but rather than try and, you know, just narrowly focus on where they could have the most impact, they, they issued an overly broad solution that I think is brought, but one of the reasons why they're now been, you know, in the place they are where a court has told them, step back, this you've gone too far. Right. No, it's, a, it's a great uh, read on it, uh, where it goes. So we are basically out of time, but let me always finish with asking you, how can folks in this room get involved uh, in advocating for the ASC model at both the state and federal level? Well, I'll be brief because I've already really said it. We need we need everyone in the ASC community to be an advocate for the ASC community and the ASC model. So you need to know who your lawmakers are. Bring your lawmaker, whether a state lawmaker or a federal lawmaker, to your facility. Let them see what you're doing in their community to help their constituents get really good health care. There's nothing you can do that is more impactful in terms of trying to help tell our story and, and help us to try and advocate, you know, whether at the state level or at the federal level, on your behalf. Great. Well, Bill, thank you very, very much again for joining us. And, and are you free for the 12th? Symposium? Can I get you now? <laughs> no. That's, well, if I get my trophy, maybe. So. <laughs> I will, we'll on. get you a trophy. We will get you a trophy. <laughs> Thank you very much again. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. Hope you have a great day. You as well.